Otherwise, I'll get kicked off. Um, and we're live. Um, all right, guys. Um, I've been um, watching a friend of mine. Um, well, anybody I you know that I think has an interesting thing to say, I always consider a friend. Um, and I, um, hello from New Zealand, everybody. Uh, wherever you are watching, thank you for joining us today. And um, as always, you know, I like dialogue, I like discussions, and I like to hear other people's opinions, whether they are in line with me or not. It doesn't really matter to me as long as people are talking and, uh, you know, are willing to come on board. I've been trying to get uh, uh, Black Sage um, D, a gamer, uh, on, um, on Twitter. It's my first time to have somebody from Twitter to come and, you know, discuss anything with us about pop culture and, um, you know, whatever's going on and comic books related, as well as politics and you know, everything that involves us as human beings in life. Uh, so thank you for watching us. It's a very beautiful day here in Whangarei. Sun's out. And um, I was able to get uh, Black Sage to come on and have a discussion. You've seen some of the things um, I've just said. I think I posted about what he said about, um, you know, gaming industry and stuff like that on, on the comic trade page, as you've probably read. And so I will... Black Sage, take it away, brother. I'll introduce yourself and let the folks here in New Zealand know and wherever anybody else is watching know who you are and uh, what you're about. Well, hello, everyone. This is Black Sage D here. I am a guy from America who is sick and tired of the outrage culture that's been going on. And uh, yeah, fuck commies. <laughs> that's, that's all you really know, need to know about me. I'm anti-communist, pro-capitalist, and I like video games and anime titties. What's, what's there not to love? So how did you get involved with um, gaming? And, you know, I mean, like a lot of people get started younger, but I mean, um, how did you get more, vo how did you become more vocal about gaming? Well, I started, you, you want me to talk about when I started or started gaming or how did I become more vocal? How you became more vocal? Well, I became more vocal, I want to say in 2018 when I started to really get on Twitter because I, the only social media platform that I actually used was Facebook, and even then it wasn't that much. So mm. you can imagine how much of a, a more of a, a, a viral platform Twitter is. So um, yeah, I become more vocal about gaming, mostly because of the fact that in, I would like to say late 2018 is when Sony became more, you know, they implemented a policy that censored Japanese games when it comes to sexual content. And it's like, it was inconceivable. It was, sorry, it was inconceivable to me at the time that Sony would actually do such a thing. And I thought that Sony was the main platform that, you know, supported all sorts of games being made within reason, of course, but still. And they used the Me Too movement as an excuse to do that, which looking back at it now, it not only uh, died and faded into obscurity, thanks to um, good old Joe Biden, the Me Too movement is just now done, it's done. So there's really no point in even censoring games now. But ultimately, <clears throat> ultimately, I don't really like how just the gaming industry in general has been overtaken by activists, left-wing activists at that. And you may look no further than um, what you're seeing this past week with all of these gaming companies trying to bend the knee and show how woke they are by saying Black Lives Matter and, oh, we're going to black out our pictures and stuff. Mm. And it's just, it's, it's, it, it, it really opened a lot of eyes to a lot of people these days. So, I mean, ultimately, what I've come to the conclusion is that more than ever now my voice does matter mm. because i'm trying to what i do is important because i'm trying to expose the hypocrisy within mm. the gaming community or gaming industry i'm sorry and what i would hope to do one day is to release a video game that can combat this rapid left-wing i'm sorry left-wing extremism it's it's kind of interesting um um like for those people who don't know about Joe Biden and the situation there with the Me Too movement, do you want to fill them in? Um, are you able to do that for us? 
Well, without getting too into details, getting too graphic, let's just say that Joe Biden, uh, for I would say for as politely as possible, is that Joe Biden assaulted a woman in a very inappropriate way. And the entire movement collapsed on itself because none of the Democratic Party and none of the um, the far left were willing to call him out. All these far left activists were willing to call him out because they are so desperate to get Trump out of office. And that's what happened. It, the Me Too movement just instantly collapsed on itself. So, I mean, that's basically she came out and accused him of it and everybody said, ah, we don't believe you. And, well, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not that they don't believe her. It's just that they want Trump out of office. Hmm. So it was it was either um, you know let's let's leave you out because it's more important for us to make sure that um, our movement works. You know, like our our pres our nominee gets in over what's right and justice is served. Yes, yes. And even the main founders of the Me Too movement basically said, "This is not it. This is not what we fought for." So, hmm. yeah, so even I think what her name is, Mo Rose McGowan, she came out and said that she is done. She's done with it. She, like she can't, yeah. she can't, she can't support it anymore. So it's, it goes back to what I said. The far left, they always eat themselves alive. Yeah. And and I think and I can stand by Rose McGowan because, you know, she stood, you know, she doesn't, she didn't a waver at this, you know, even though her, her, her side was, yeah, you know, we're not into this. And she was, you know, right from the start saying, this is how it is. And and I and I appreciate people who, you know, who don't um, waver for politics reasons or and are not hypocrites. And I mean, I hate hypocrisy, hypocrisy in myself. I always check myself. And one thing, like you mentioned about like these companies, who gaming companies who, who in the past basically... They stay you know, political. They didn't yeah, get into it. they get into it. They, t they choose sides because, and I think that's the hypocrisy there is amazing. You know, when they start putting out old black, um, you know, black over their uh, logos, like YouTube did it, you know, and I, I laughed at it, that it, because it's, meaning, it's meaningless. Exactly. And, and when I saw that, I was like, I remember all these conservative black people, you chucked off your platform, right? Right. And all these black um, conserv um, people that you chucked off Twitter and off Facebook, and here now you're going to go all black and go, I'm all black, lives matter. And the hypocrisy behind that just made me chuckle and go, well, yeah, right. And next week, there'll be a new thing you'll be behind, and you'll be trying to do that. I mean, it's freaking Pride Month, so they, they pretty much say oh, black lives matter for like three days, and then they used to go right back to pander into the alphabet community. And you know what's funny is that none of these companies celebrated Black History Month, but now all of a sudden Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Like, come on, now Black History Month was like February, right? Right. So it's like, I, I just find it hilarious how you guys can sit there and talk about your allies and, oh, you support the Black community, when you know damn well that you guys didn't even say one peep about Black History Month, didn't say one thing about Black history when it comes to Black yeah. game developers. And you guys basically, you're doing this for instant cash grab. It's nothing it's more than a cash grab, so I don't, I don't, I don't respect any company that does that. And that's it, isn't it? It's like it, it's all about money, and, and I and um, it's always about money. And people don't understand that, that it's always about money. When when uh, when DC uh, D DC comes out and starts going on about doing their thing, it's black. I go, what about uh, what about Dwayne Duffy, McDuffie? You know, what exactly. about him, his company with uh, Milestone Studios? What, how did you treat him? You know, when way back when, when he was trying to get that started up, I think it was in the 90s, um, you know, and he worked for Marvel and then came up to DC. And they just basically pushed that whole Milestone to the, uh, stuff to the side. And then when he died, they brought back Static Shock as a, as a one-off sort of thing, you know, to say, hey, yeah, we appreciate what he's done for us. And that's when I go, well, guys, these guys don't really care about anything but the bottom dollar. Exactly. Uh, tell me about the, um, um, because I'm, I'm not so much aware of gaming myself. All I've done, um, you know, I've, I've played it and I've been a kid, uh, you know, growing up, I've played, you know, Tomitrons and Ataris. And it's not never been my thing about um, the creation side of things. 
but you've been playing, you know, you're a gamer specifically. And so um, how do you see the gaming um, community and, um, you know, um, and well, you talked about how these guys don't actually help the black gamers or black creators uh, and developers. Um, tell me more about that. Well, there's always been black people in the gaming industry, right? It's just mostly doing the level up, um, the lower level work, right? So honestly, is 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 less to do with you know the first of all, the entire gaming community just wants to escape, you know. It's just that the entire gaming community just wants to escape from all the bad stuff that's happening, and slowly, um, it just happened actually very recently, right? <clears throat> This whole left wing stuff in gaming happened actually pretty recently, and it's just slowly metabolized to the point where it's like this to the point where now you have live service video games, online video games, basically plastering Black Lives Matter onto loading screens. Mm. And it's like, what, what the hell does that have to do with anything? It's like you guys are your hot dog salesmen, pretty much, in a sense. It's like, why are you, why are you over here trying to give me a political lecture? Yeah, and it's been going into its way inside the video games to how the female characters dress, to how you're basically seeing all of these political propaganda being pushed, extremely leftist. And by the way, it's like I've been talking to every everybody out there when it comes to game development, and nobody can tell me anybody who's an open Trump supporter in the gaming mm -hmm. industry. Nobody can tell me that, or well, not even a Trump supporter, just a very right wing person. Nobody can tell me that because they've either been kicked out of the industry or they've been silenced. So and this same thing happened with same thing that's happening with comics, comics as well. Right? Yeah, it's, it has, it's it's just now starting to take roost, hmm. at least in the Western side, at least. Do you think? Um, do you think anything good will come with come with this whole uh, you know uh, hypocrisy? of these gaming companies oh yeah think... everybody's starting to notice now because it's like everywhere you look with and within these companies within these posts they're pretty much roasting everybody's pretty much roasting the hell out of these companies mm -hmm. people people have had enough of this and you know uh honestly it's like the best thing you can do is to make your own game so you don't have to worry about you know something being tainted by identity politics that's it. And I think the, the good thing I, I've noticed because I've just started playing um, visual novels because I'm being a writer and stuff and I just, I, I just love the idea of visual novels and the idea that like with Patreon and with like crowdfunding is amazing to me. I think that whole concept that you can just get do it by yourself or get along with your friends and create your own thing and not worry about any big, div, um, you know, div, um, gaming uh, console thing out there yeah. where you can just directly go to your, to the to the guys out there and say, hey, look, I'm doing this. Here's what I'm looking at doing. Can you support me? And 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 I know, and I'm for that. I think that's the grassroots things of actually creating anything. Uh, have you have you um you know have you been um seen anything more about that or have you been um have you know uh, fellow creators or fellow ga oh, well, gamers well you know? yeah every, uh, yeah you have a whole lot of game developers using crowdfunding now to make their game mostly because of the fact that um they don't want to be controlled by these major corporations anymore. Mm. and honestly um is when you have these crowdfunding platforms yeah most people go to kickstarter but they also go to indiegogo as well so you're going to see a whole lot more game developers, a bunch of new age game developers trying to enter the market. Um, when it comes to visual novels, though, I do, I, I am, I, I, call me, um, when it comes to visual novels, you said you like them, right? So yeah. if you want to get into visual novels, uh, the first thing I would probably ask you to do is to um, try playing as many visual novels as you can uh you know if you want to really get into making them uh there's this game engine called renpy and it's pretty much what all what most major um visual novels are using these days and there's also this program called live 2d which pretty much uh creates fluid animations for um 2d drawings and characters awesome yeah and 
with Japan, it's like that's pretty much one of the most popular genres of games out there for them, at least. Yeah, I, I didn't realize how. I mean, I, 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 that's where I actually, to be honest, that's where I heard the whole idea of these things because, like, going back a couple of years, but I didn't realize what what it was. That's you know, and even I think I asked you on on Twitter about what it was when I think either you or someone else was talking about these uh, anim, anime games, and it was like VN. I was like, what's VN? And somebody responded, it's a visual novel. And that's when I started looking into it. And um, and I went onto itch.io and um, itch.io and there was all these amazing, you know, uh, developers with all, any sort of games you could think of putting it out there. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And you, you're right, you know, like um, um, all these different, um, the ones you mentioned like Rampy and stuff, um, and they're so, they're free. They're free to use. Yeah, and- that's, that's the thing. That's the great equalizer when it comes to game development. You got programs like Krita, um, Blender, 3D. Um, you got all these alternatives out there that you can use to get started making video games. And you even have you know game engines like Godot, um, Godot, Unity, and even on Unreal, Unreal Engine 4 or Unreal Engine 5 is coming out. And they were 100% free. Well, I know for a fact that, you know, with Unity you and Unreal, you have to pay a license, but with Godot, it's 100% free. But uh, you can do that, though. You can definitely get started making It's never been a more accessible time to make video games than now. And, but, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, I mean, you can have all these big Xbox and Nintendo and all these other companies saying, oh, well... Speak, oh, speaking of visual novels, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but uh, one of the biggest games that are going out right now is a game called Helltaker. Have you heard of that? No. Yeah, it's Hell, a... Um, Helltaker? It's, yeah. So it's a visual novel that pretty much um, is actually a visual novel slash puzzle game, right? And what it does is that... <clears throat> What it does is it's pretty much a very short game, right? But it's free to play as um, indie, and it's pretty much – I can't really tell you that much about it without spoiling it, but yeah. let's just say that um, it, it got really popular in Japan, and it's a Western main game. Hmm. Yeah. And pretty but much all you do is make pancakes, really. <laughs> a game about – like, it reminds me of um... – Food Wars. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's not it's not exactly like Food Wars, but it's definitely um a game that you can uh it's definitely a game that you um might want to check out. Awesome. I, I've been it's um, on Steam like, right now. On Steam? Yeah, it's on Steam. And actually you can play a lot of visual novel games on like say Jast USA, um Steam, Gog, and uh Manga Gamer. Yeah. yeah. One of the things um, one of the things I noticed was like with um with these guys who like uh with the Patreon side of things they um you know they uh, you're able to just download it to your you don't even need a uh, a console. You know, you're talking about Steam and all that. Uh, you yeah. can just download directly to your PC or to your Android um um you know um phone or whatever. And um and you can just play it. And I've been doing that with my um, with my Mac, just downloading and going, okay, this is cool. And you're right, you know, there's so many games, but also like you were talking about how learning, if you wanted to create these uh, visual novels, which I think is the greatest thing in the world, because I think, um, because everybody's got a story to tell, as they say, and you know, everybody's yeah. got one story inside them. What better way to you, do it than to do a visual novel? Uh, because um, you're in control of your art, and you're in control of your, what you're saying and, uh, you know, what you and, wanted. And, to, the, and the thing is, and, and the thing is, though, is that vi- many visual novels have many different paths, depending on the choices that you make. So mm-hmm. you may come out with a completely different ending than the one that you intentionally want. Yeah. So there's a, a replay. There's a massive replay value within that. And plus, you can uh, quick load and quick save random scenarios. That's so you it. Can, jump right back in in case you want to just uh take a different path mm. and there's so many of them i mean like you can go from playing a dungeons and dragons type game 
to uh, you know playing a sci-fi game in space and um, and then also a uh, you know um, an everyday type game I, I always forget what it's called um, you know when it's just a normal life game or playing a school you know based in school based in the adult world wherever and and the whole idea of being able to write to choose a path is the best thing in the world where I, I kind of think of it as like being a, a movie like you're the you're the hero of your movie and yeah. you're choosing which um, action to take and you talk you know you talk about how it can keep you can keep playing it I usually go back and um, um, because it's like the instant save module you're talking about it's amazing because you can just go okay I'm gonna save this choice onto another uh, you know on this area here because it gives you you know different um, places to save it and then you can go well I'll go back to that if I stuff up and let's see how that choice happens whereas in life you can't have that right you can't choose a different path and go back and choose it again and that that whole idea of picking up uh, like what back in you know back in my youth um, back in the 80s we had books called uh, pick a path and you could uh, you know do the same yeah, thing your own adventure right yeah, and it's it's amazing to be able to choose your own adventure. And I think um, people who don't haven't played visual novels don't really understand how amazing it is to just be there, you know, just choosing your way. Whereas everybody's all um, excited about, you know, they talk about first shooter or um, RPGs and so on, and thinking that's the greatest thing ever. But when you actually, you know, when they're talking about the whole, you know, uh, what is it called? Um, um, you know, uh, when you're in in game, um, there were t um, oh man, it's you know uh, they were talking about how like you can be um, uh, like being your own movie, and they did this thing with um, Michelle Rodriguez where she was you know you could be the hero and she'd come and pick you up and you go along and you do this all these actions in there, uh, virtual reality. That's it. Always. Yeah, virtual reality. Yeah. But this is the uh, this kind of feels like virtual reality where you know you are playing your game. And you are part of the hero in there. Whatever you know, whatever choice you want to make, you can um, be an um, LGBT character. Uh, you can be um, a straight person, or so on. And or you can be an animal, and you can choose whatever you want to play as. And I think um, one thing I did realize is that a lot of um, the gamers who create these games, they don't um, have somebody to edit their text. You know, the stories and a lot of frustration. I find is when um, a lot of them don't actually bring on somebody and go, "Hey, can you read my, you know, read my text?" Yeah, so that's, they... that's that's part of the uh, one of the main. Re so you have, when you're making a visual novel, of course, you do need an editor, you need somebody to you know make sure that it's not going down to complete gibberish at the end of the day. Yeah, and it it it's like you always need somebody to really create checks and balances within a game development team. What works what doesn't work and find a nice combination and balance that you would need in a video game. Uh, by the way, I sent you a link. Um, it's on GOG right now. It's called Sunrider Mask of Art Arcadius. And I really want you to check out that um, game. It's a visual novel combined with a, um, a strategy game. Let me just put that up here. Yeah. There we go. All right, it's in chat now. Yeah, it's in the chat. Um, yeah, it's, and the, I think when you, like, these guys who are developing, um, especially if they're from foreign country and um, uh, English isn't their first language, I find that because it's not their first language, they think that whatever they're writing in their own language will transfer really well if they use Google Translator. But instead yeah. of getting somebody as an editor on board and saying, hey, look, can you have a look at my, you know, and it ruins the game. And I think if you're spending like um, some guy was saying, he spent three years developing this game, and you and and the you know like you said gibberish, the language comes out, um, text comes out as gibberish. You're standing there for about a minute or two. I'm um, sitting there for a minute or two trying to figure out what's going on. And after reading it, you know, going through there for half an hour, you go, oh, you just give up on the game, and you don't even feel like supporting the um, um, creator or developer well, anymore it's because not, it's, it's not just a. Um Sorry, it's just not it's not just a, a literary sense. It's not just a technical sense. It's just that it's the fact that the story itself does not make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. And that's what an editor is there for. Well, that's what a competent editor is there for. It's like it's something that's actually very desperately lacking in say 
the comic book industry is where all the editors just basically it just gives with all the editors they just basically do nothing but just let things flow because they don't have the background needed to 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 make to give a good product and at the end of the day that's what video games are products first and foremost that's right I mean, everybody that's doing anything here, I mean, in the art, it's they're trying to pass, you know, sell something to somebody else to enjoy. And a lot of people, the one thing really uh, annoys me is people don't, they think they're not capitalists when they're doing this. Uh, they oh, don't yeah. think that they're, um, that they are actually creating a product. They just think they're trying to do this to give away. But they don't realize at the end of the day, they got to eat. And then when they starve, they complain that nobody's buying their games, you know, and nobody's supporting them. And, you know, like you just talked about the um, uh, comic book industry, you know, people selling 8,000 comics in Marvel or 18,000 in Marvel compared to 100,000 a few years back for a title. That's that comes down to the editor because the editors, like you said, has um, they let things pass. And you look at the DC, um, you know, the well, quality they, yeah, of the vertigo. Thing. Sorry, excuse me for a second. So, um, you know, when DC back in the um, 80s and 90s and even 2000s when they had the DC uh, Vertigo thing, a lot of what we see quality work came out was there because they had amazing two female uh, editors like uh, Karen Berger and Shelley Bond. But you look at when they went away, Vertigo died when they got this other guy there and then he just didn't know what he was doing. Um, and that was really weird to see uh, amazing, you know, like, I mean, I've got vertigo things right here, you know, uh, the preacher and oh, stuff oh. And, and all that, you know, and I'm going, well, why are these, you know, you got preacher, you got a whole bunch of other stuff um, that, you know, that these guys basically, these two females were amazing at knowing how to edit and go get all these British guys there and go, right. You know, and as you know, preachers an amazing thing, and the boys was started there as well, but had to go away because it was against the whole policy of uh, DC. Now, yeah, I have, I have yet to. I'm gonna let you go on talk about what you, what we're gonna say. Sorry, no, I, I was just about to say I have yet to read the preacher. Um, I, oh, it's glorious. I, saw, I saw the um, TV show though. Yeah, ah, uh, preacher's glorious. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to buy the hard covers after, after um, you know, reading it. It was just. It's 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 something else. I mean, the TV show is such you know it's it's its own thing, but the but the graphic novel um, novels are just amazing. But that's the other thing, right? So if you look at um um I, uh, I think it's Violet, was it Violet his um his girlfriend? Well, in the book she isn't black, right? right. And so so they had to make her black for the TV show, and I'm like, okay. All right, but she works. She's a glorious actress. She's the most beautiful actress, I, you know, and she did an amazing job. She really did a good job. And I think, um, and the way the story was told is amazing for the TV show. It was just brilliant. And, yeah. uh, but, but, the, but the comics, man, you, it's a laugh a minute. It's just in your face, uh, just the whole, you know, tears it apart. Um, you know, the whole, um, it's just a great thing to read. And the other thing um, that's worth reading, um, I've, uh, if you haven't read it yet, is Transmetropolitan by um, uh, is it Morrison, Grant Morrison. Oh, no, not Grant Morrison, sorry. Uh, the other guy who I can't remember his name of. Let me see if I've got it here. Yeah. Um, probably here somewhere. It's hidden and I can't see it. But uh, oh, here we go. This one here. Okay. Transmetropolitan. This is what got me into... Um, wanting to uh, Warren Ellis and Derek Robertson and I've met Derek Robertson he's a great guy but he's very uh one-sided in his politics oh D Derek but he's a great great artist but this is what got me into being um thinking about radio and being a journalist you know really yeah and I I think um if you retransmit man and this is like another vertigo book this you know this is when Vertigo was in its glorious days. And I was um, quite sad when um, that guy destroyed that whole imprint. And, you oh, know, yeah. it, was, it was that and Zoe Quinn. I, um, I think what, Zoe, what was with Zoe Quinn with her um, book there? Because there was something with her book about the wall or something. Was that it or was it something else? I, I think it was called Goddess Mode. 
it, it, it was a very terrible book that had nothing but walls of text, you know, the usual um, left wing preaching. And it was just it was just already a terrible mess. And plus, it's like she hired nothing but people who wanted to get into identity politics, too. So ultimately, um, ultimately, it's like that, that that label was not that label was not last a lot. It was not meant to last. So, um, gosh, I, I really could go really deep into it, but we'd be here all day doing it. <laughs> well, I mean, give us an overview because I don't know much about this person apart from just, uh, I think, so her whole Zoe Quinn is basically on the same level as Anita Sarkeesian, in which she is a professional grifter that uses social justice to get into every institution she could get her hands on. And then she pretty much has been the kiss of death with every company she's been involved in. Mm -hmm. She no, her, she came out of the whole uh, Gamergate thing because I don't know much about Gamergate she, because she I was, came into was, it very was, slow. Yeah, she was patient zero for Gamergate actually. Can you tell us a bit about that because I I have no idea about that because it's you know gaming okay. like isn't my um isn't really <laughs> my um thing. All right, so the T D so the T L D R version of it. Zoe Quinn um let's just say she had relations with a game journalist and he reviewed her game with very um, positive review. So that called into the question of the ethics of the game journalism. And then instead of actually calling this person out, calling the, um, the person out, her um, boyfriend at the time, who was working, I think it was a Kotaku writer. I forgot the guy's name, I'm sorry. But uh, instead of doing that, the entire industry defended her pretty much and defended the Kotaku writer. So pretty much, you know, the gaming community wasn't having none of it. So they had to look in deeper into the ethics of gaming. And what it uncovered was is that a whole left wing clique pretty much took hold inside the gaming industry. So it sounds like nepotism. It is nepotism. It's like they hire their friends into this industry. So ultimately, <clears throat> ultimately, the way the, the mess we're in now inside the gaming industry is because these people hire their own. Mm. It's these it's these insane fringe leftists, pretty much. And I don't want to harp on to the whole, oh, these left-wing politics, these left-wing people, but it really does go back to, it's like, it goes back to like far left extremism, pretty much invading almost every institution imaginable, even institutions that have nothing to do with social justice. They just want to sell video games. Yeah, and I think that's where uh, the whole idea of, um, you know, um, being a um, your own developer, your own uh, setting up your own company, setting up your own uh, group of friends to create games is the best way to go now, I think. I mean, even with, you know, with comics, with, um, you know, myself being, you know, running my own comic company and so on, being able to do your own work keeps, you know, you can bring in your own friends to create whatever you want to create, but it's your own thing. And yes, the opportunities yeah. to actually make money off it, to get it out to the world is so amazingly intense now because you can, you know, like me sitting with you here, you're in America and we're having a discussion about all these things, uh, pop culture and stuff, you know, gaming and comic books, well, and, I, well, I, you know, and people can sell like this to each other and not even worry about the middle guy who is basically going to take 70% off their income. You know, like with um with Apple, you know, you basically end up they take about thirty percent or something of the, you know the high mark. And the other thing with Patreon now, you know, getting taxed and stuff like that, that's weird. Yeah, it's like with the gaming industry. I feel that it started with the nerds, and it's going to continue with the nerds. And yeah. you already have the people who created these legacy franchises. They're not just breaking off and doing their own thing now. So they're not going to be beholden to corporate politics anymore. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see the new generation pop up 
you know, see a new wave, a new generation. And it's like, once again, I, 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 I hate to keep saying this, but it's true. It's like these leftist institutions, once they take over, they always collapse within themselves. Yeah. So it's not a matter of what we can do. It's a matter of when they can fall so we can take over. And, and I think they're, they're falling over now. I mean, like we yeah. already saw the, um, the um, comic book industry fall over at the start of lockdown, you know, uh, well, worldwide. And within two weeks, um, you know, Diamond went down, DC went down, and all the other guys went down along with it, with Marvel. And and next thing you know, it's like, which has already had been happening for a few years, that, um, you know, with um, com uh, with um, Comic Skate and stuff like that, those guys teaming up and just doing their own thing. Um, but okay. also not just them, but everybody else is going, well, you know, I'm never going to get into Marvel with those politics. I'm never going to go into DC with those politics or even image. It seems with Eric Larson, you know, hopping on about looters and stuff and, and being with them as such, you know? Um, and whereas you can just like, we're talking about, like you can just jump on and use these free engines to create your own games. I mean, um, there are other engines that if you can do other proper games apart from visual um, novels. Um, have you, you know, uh, have you, do you know more about those, um, you know, um, d um, d um, sorry, engines as well? Or, um, do I know about those really engines? Really? Well, I do know that, um, as far as the engines that people use, uh, most indie developers use Unity pretty much. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you want to go a little bit more high spec, you might want to use Unreal. But the thing is, Unreal has a very, very, very steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. And plus it has like, I think a million lines of, like, I think one, 11 million lines of code. Wow. So it's going to be very steep to learn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> most game developers do make their own engines, though. So that's one thing. With these, and um, you many, know, and, and I'm sorry, one more thing is that yeah. many game engines are actually based off of the Quake engine. Okay. Yeah. What's that? What's that? It's basically the you know how you remember the games called Quake. Yeah. Yeah, that's where many uh, game engines are based off of. Um, I think even Unreal is based off of Quake. I think. And, I remember. Yeah. Playing a bit of that, but was didn't really get more that much into the Quake um, thing. Yeah, it was meant to be um, the Quake engine was meant to be a, you know, a very optimized engine, and that's why you see um, that's why all the Call of Duty games are based off of Quake. Those are great games, Call of Duty. Yeah, it's just um, I remember um, getting that was one of the first games I got it back into about in two thousand ten. And just enjoyed it, but I suck at I suck at uh, you know controllers because of my um, wrist injury. So, um, so what sort of games do you actually play yourself? Um, um, to me personally, it's mostly RPGs and um, Metroidvanias. And when I had the time, I usually do play first-person shooters. Right. Uh, but as a whole, like action games, um, kind of like Double May Cry or. No Astral Chain, those are games I usually enjoy the most, like that and Dark Souls. Right. So when you were growing up, what what was the games that you that got you into gaming? Oh boy. <laughs> so growing up, uh, my first game console was indeed a Super Nintendo, and the games that I usually played on it was, um, let's see, Super Castlevania Four, uh, yeah. Mario Kart. Uh, Donkey Kong Country and uh, F Zero Kirby. Um, tragically enough, I didn't play Link to the Past until like much later. But uh, yeah, it's just, it, 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 I played most of these games, and one of my favorite games, uh, gosh, it would have to be on the Super Nintendo. It wasn't Chrono Trigger. I think it was. Arc Razor, which is this type of game that you can, um, yeah, Arc Razor. Uh, it's kind of this uh, sort of the strategy game mixed with the um, platformer. It's a uh, really, it's really good. What got what got you into it? I mean, like I know with uh, with 
with any sort of, uh, you know, things like me with when I was, com I got into comic books very young and uh, the whole visual thing got me into it and the, and the stories. What got you into gaming? Well, it's the sense of exploration and collection is what got me into gaming. And one of my favorite games of all time is pretty much Mega Man. Right. That that that's a rock solid game for me. It's basically a platformer. You, uh, you're a robot, um, and you go ahead and you fight other evil robots and you gain their powers and you go through the stages, learning how to conquer each stage. And then you, uh, once you defeat the robot master or the robot boss, you uh, take their power for your own, and you use that to um, get uh, traverse the game more. And when you reach the final boss, you use all the skills that you learn and you use all the skills that you learn to over overtake the final boss, Dr. Wiley. Mm -hmm. Yes. And my my second favorite game of all time is indeed Sonic the Hedgehog. Right. So you enjoyed this movie? Yes, I did. I um I um I went with my friend who's like who who loves who's a he's a real gamer, right? Um yeah. And um and um so that sort of got me into wanting to go to this movie. And I I when I was a kid, I wasn't really into you know when Sonic the Hedgehog came out, I wasn't really into Sonic the Hedgehog or the game or stuff. But I had friends who used to play it, um mm -hmm. you know back in the nineties and stuff. But we went to see this movie and like even um I I went and watched it the other day with my family and they loved it, you know the whole um concept of you know this these characters they were lovable characters everybody in it was enjoying themselves the story was good and you you know you could really have a good time with the whole family and enjoy um, watching this thing yes what, and that's, what, did, that, yeah, what did you um think about it well i think that it's a movie that is very respectful to the fan base overall mm -hmm. and what i really liked is the fact that they did listen to the fans and they changed Sonic's design, which yeah. was admittedly very horrible. And when they did that, you know, you got, you know, the usual suspects on the um, yeah. left media basically complaining, uh, oh, you gave into the fans' demands. Oh, you bent the knee to them. And oh, that, that, that means that you're going to give more energy to toxic fandoms. And it blew up in their face because now it pretty much it, it became one of the most, ironically, the most like celebrated movies of this year. That that blew my mind. I mean, when I like you said, like when I saw the first design, I was like, I cringed. I was like, oh, what is that? Yeah. You know, even I, as a as a normie, looked at that, um, you know, that first Im um, image and design of that. I was like, oh, this is not good. You know, mm -hmm. it kind of felt weird. And I was like, well, I don't know much about Sonic, but why are everybody else talking about it being like this? And then I thought, let's have a look at this. And I was telling my brain about it. It's like, what do you think of this? He goes, that doesn't look right. But the other thing was Jim Carrey came out and started slamming the fans over, you know, saying, go back to the, you know, take it and the redesign it. And he, you know, and he's been quiet ever since I noticed. Yeah, he, he changed his mind about it because yeah. it's like, ultimately, when you do it, if you, if you obey the fandom, if you obey the fandom, you'll get good results. It's like, here's the thing. Communists do not have money. They don't. Right. Yeah. Nerds they do. They mommy's money. Yeah, nerds, nerds yeah. do. Nerds right. are willing to spend three hundred dollars on a damn yeah. statue. Yeah, communists are yeah. constantly sleeping on their friend's couch, right? Doing nothing but eating their chicken tendies and bitching yeah. about Twitter, and always talking about ramen, right? And Harry you know, Potter. They, they, they always talk about ramen. They don't talk about you know, you know, um, any other food because you know it's always yeah. that, like. Ramen. And you're talking about like uh, nerds, right? Um, you know, um, I, I consider myself a geek buying statues and buying product because oh, yeah. we all save up to get what we want. But like I said, those guys, they don't really buy the product. They just harp on about about fans all day long. And, and, and here's the thing about Sonic the Hedgehog. Mm. Uh, he's pretty much a blue hedgehog that runs really fast. <laughs> That's yeah. all you need to know. <laughs> That's it. And, he, and he's friends with other technicolored animals. Yeah. So, right. He's not even human. All right. <laughs> I think that, uh, it's uh, the whole idea of toxic fandom, right? Um, 
I, I find it very offensive because sure there are some toxic people out there, but they're not representative of all of us nerds and geeks out there who actually love and have have been um, you know have been enjoying these things for decades. What I find really strange is someone who discovered Sonic last week has yeah. a pro has a problem with Sonic, right? And um, and has a problem with the fans because they just discovered this last week. And same thing happened with uh, with uh, Star Wars, and you know with um, with comics and stuff. It's like, oh, I just read uh, you know that there's a black uh, black Spider Man. You know, now we need to have make sure there's a black female Spider Man. Now we need to have yeah, this. Like, what it's like no, normies don't. Here's the thing: normies only buy into surface level stuff. They are not mm. the ones that buy the merchandise. And the main reason why Star Wars is so it has declined overall is the, the fact that they don't buy the merch. It's like the fact right. that they stop margin the merchandise. Right. And if their merchandise, just, yeah, I was just going to show you that. That's what's <laughs> that. But right. If your merchandise sales go down. Yeah. It's like your franchise dies. Like every major franchise you've ever known survives mm -hmm. off merch. Right. That's been my thing, like with with creating our um like with our, um with creating my incredible and red dot characters with my friend, it's like merchandise, right? I got to make sure there's toys coming out on this because or t-shirts. I got to make sure that this is the next thing because you know only so many people will read the books, but a lot more people will wear the t-shirts, will buy the toys and stuff, and let's make a game around it. And so on, and you're right. I mean, like, you look at what Spielberg did way back in the um, 70s, right? Late uh, late 70s. He basically said, "You guys can have whatever you want with the movie. I'll have the toy rights. Thank you very much." Yeah. And and you got and he had a two billion dollar was it four billion dollar industry just around the whole um um you know only six movies, but he had a whole uh, industry around just the merchandising of it. I mean, like, you got Lego um, Star Wars, you got Lego, uh, you got the games. You know all that merchandise, but now you look at it, the nobody's buying it. And they even said that recently. Um, there was this whole thing with the, one of the toy, big huge toy um, designers who said nobody's wanting this. You know these characters. I heard. I, I heard even Star Trek is basically. I heard Star Trek's toys are basically not even being made because nobody wants. Nobody wants it. Yeah. Well, I didn't even watch this new Picard thing. I was like, nah, I'm not gonna have this this amazing character who I adore. Right. This amazing captain of the starship who I adored with the next generation gets slaughtered, right? His whole, his whole, um, his whole identity as as a as a leader, as a you know, as a leader in his um, universe, be slaughtered because of politics that is happening now. Because I, I reckon, you know, give me twenty years, you know, and people are going to look back and say they ruined pop culture. All these people, they ruined. All these amazing franchises because of and identity and it, politics, and it does nothing for their cause. It just basically causes people to despise each other even more. And that's the weird thing. It's like um, it's it doesn't help anyone. I mean, I was just what, reading this thing with um, uh, about uh, Snowflake and um, I heard Swamp that got canceled. I heard yeah. that canceled. Yeah, I just saw that from um, Clownfish TV. They were saying that it's going to get canceled and or has been canceled. And they, when you start catering to specific groups in a way that you did it because you were trying to virtue signal, people can see straight through that. And I think a lot of people, um, these companies think we're stupid. You know, they think that we are idiots and, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, they, they can get hoodwink us and get one over on us by trying to placate to specific groups. And those specific groups turn around on them. I um I laughed at the whole idea where um, they made a fat native Indian with a backpack and said this is what these people are like, and mm -hmm. they couldn't see the hypocrisy or the racism actually in that because they just said, well, you know what, we'll take a photo of that person there and we'll make it into a, into a cartoon image of that, and I found that very offensive, but I found it already. It, 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 I found it as funny as well because it was like so blind in that yeah you saw the writer right <laughs> that, that's pure unadulterated soy right there never go yeah. full soy people 
I'm yeah. glad you said it. I've been trying to not say soy or anything like that about these guys. It's just that, um, yeah, it's like even when you hear this guy, he's got no backbone. He's a you know, he has no bass in his voice. Yeah, there's no, there's no like, hey, um, you know, this is what I think about my character. This is why I did it, and um, and these are the reasons I did it. But and no, it's he like, talks, and, he, and, he, and he talks to these characters like, oh, he'll hit my pronouns. His pronouns are he, him. Uh, they down it's like it's like the whole pronoun thing it's only something that's stuck to like tumblr it's not someone it's not commonplace it's not the real world nobody wants this people know who they are mm. and it's it's like these people are pandering to only a small fringe base of people and what uh, what these companies have to understand is that twitter is not the real world these companies are not the real world but that's what their marketing departments tell them. I think, um, where are we? I um, I had something here, but about Twitter, I was going to put up, but I think I lost it somewhere. Um, let's talk about Twitter and your activity on Twitter. Oh boy. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so. I just want to know that I treat everybody with respect and love, and I just want to say that, um, yeah, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but seriously, though, it's like with my, um, uh, with my com with my tirade on Twitter, um, I, I that's when I usually go ham, and I have to, um. I have to really watch what I say on Twitter, yeah. Because it, 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 it they, they they'll just ban you for saying okay, dude. I don't know if they give. I don't know if they ban you. On I Twitter. saw that. That was amazing with uh Zuby. I, yeah. I um, it's very interesting that you could basically. And here's the thing, right? That really reminds me of this whole thing about Twitter going Black Lives Matter. Zuby's black. <laughs> exactly. In Hollywood, Black Lives Matter, right? Yep. Um, I forgot the name now. The little little guy, in, uh, little black guy in um, uh, Jumanji. Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. Remember how they had, they try to cancel Kevin Hart? He's black. Exactly. Hollywood. Remember when, they to cancel, when when, remember when they tried to cancel Dave Chappelle, and he set them yeah. off. He's yep. Off, man. Yeah. So the hypocrisy of it, and that's when I like when they started going on about Black Lives Matter with Hollywood. I was like, what about Kevin Hart? They don't. You guys, care. Yeah. Did you guys forget Kevin Hart? He's black. All right. Zuby's black. Chappelle's black. Um, I think they more they care about things if it lines up with what they want at that current time, not with what they are as a as a you know as a corporation or thing hey which reminds me of um public enemy was one of the first hip-hop um bands i ever listened to as a as a 17 16 year old kid uh in my little uh, little township here in new zealand um and um burn hollywood burn um i think it was uh fear of a black planet and also it takes a it takes a nation of th um, thousands to hold us back i learned about Injustice in a proper way from Black, um, black um, Public Enemy, from those um, albums. You know, and this is going back in the 90s and late 80s. And they were talking about, you know, so many different things that were political. And it's like watching Twitter now and watching Facebook and watching YouTube. It's like, dude, that's like about 40 year old, you know, 30 year old things that you guys are trying to now are trying to go on about. It's like, here's the thing, like, None of these black celebrities are oppressed. They're there because of the fact that they got their money. They got their money That's by it. working their asses off. So when That's I see it. these comp these 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 black celebrities talking about Black Lives Matter, mm. why don't y'all open and talking about you know open your purse or where's your where's your stay silent? No. It's like here's the thing: why don't these black celebrities open their purse? Why don't they yeah. start opening their production companies? So they can hire as many black people as possible and give more opportunities to black creators out there. Why can't yeah. they do that? They don't because they're in it for themselves. 
That's it. It reminds me of um, they, they, they didn't have plenty of time to do this, and now all of a sudden, this is the time for them to do that. It's like, come on, man. Yeah, and th you're right there because, like, I mean, if I remember, um, 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 um hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, uh, uh, he got murdered last year. A Nipsey Hustle. Yeah, Nipsey Hustle. Uh, when I saw that happen last year, and I was like, well, he got murdered by his own community in a community that he set up business for to hire his own community, yet he got murdered. And the one thing, um, you know, in that community and the businesses, you know, that he brought up to help his community, one of the other things I was thinking is like a lot of times when um, you watch a lot of celebrity, uh, black celebrities who actually make it, you know, uh, who actually make it, they leave their community because of certain things like this, because... Yeah. Because they can't, they can't protect themselves. They can't protect their families. You actually hear them. I've listened to some interviews where they, they've talked about how they find themselves safer in white communities than they're in actually in black communities, and so they leave. You know, um, one of the songs by Public Enemy was "Polly Wanna Cracker," that talks about that. That you know, that someone, some when a black guy or black lady makes it. Uh, really good or uh, makes it and you know um, make something of themselves uh, gets rich they go and marry a white lady or white uh, man uh, because they want to get out of that situation well i mean can't can't uh, I'm, I'm not i'm not trying to get into the whole race thing too much but sure. it's like can you blame them it's like it, it, and i say that and i say that because it's like i live well, in Nipsey place, be loud. I, I, yeah i live Nipsey in the area Sorry, bro. Carry on. Um, I live in an area where you have a lot of people who came from, let's say, the city of Chicago, right? Right. And it's pretty much filled with people who left the city because they didn't want to deal with the violence anymore. They didn't want right. to deal with the nonsense. So it's just that now it's a lot more peaceful, a lot more quiet yeah. where I'm at. So you definitely have... Um, is definitely a place where it's more of a mixed area, really. Yeah. And it's a lot, it, you're right, it is a lot safer there. Yeah. And with the whole black creators, black community thing, it's like, where were all these celebrities, these black celebrities? Why didn't they open their purse? Why didn't they open, you know, their pocketbook or their wallet? Why didn't they, why didn't they do all these donations and start, Poning up the cash. Hell, where the hell was Obama when he did this? <laughs> like, come, like, come on, man. Yeah, they don't care. Yeah, they don't because care. everybody's in it for themselves, right? And at, at the end of the day, but it only matters when, um, you know, when it's the it thing, when it's the thing to think about right now. Um, and you know. You, you look at somebody like Denzel, I'm not sure what he does, or you look at somebody, you know, um, like even Kevin Hart, uh, the multimillionaires, right? Black multimillionaires. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm just, we're just talking about that because we're talking about that because it's a situation now. We can talk about white celebrities later. But um, you're right. Why are, why don't they set up the studios? Why don't they set up a, um, a um, you know, studios with just developing a school for black actors to come out and be more more kids to get into scholarships and go hey this is what we're gonna do do the old opera thing and so on but yeah even she has her own thing going on but like you look at all these little schools that you can open up uh you can develop you can actually give scholarships um you can even set up if you've got a couple of hundred you know say 10 20 million dollars you can set up your own studio because now cameras and equipment is so cheap because they you know the um, the production of it all is so even, much cheaper. Even the, even the software is cheap. I mean, if you looked at Da Vinci, um, or Da Vinci of Resolve. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, editing is so much cheaper, and like, it's it's weird when I when I uh, when they keep going on about, you know, we need to help the black community more. We can help the big community. No, I think that what we should be is the black community itself helping it more itself more. Exactly. You know? like, stop begging these corporations to give you a handout. Yeah. That that's what that really pissed me off is that you get a whole bunch of young black people not trying to take their own destiny into their own hands and start becoming individualists. Mm. And that and that and it really infuriates me because you got, you know, people like me trying to come up and trying to create something 
and yet yeah. we get called coons for basically. So, oh, sorry. No, you can carry on, but people we're need to hear what's the reality of it all. Yeah, but we're called coons because it's the fact that you know we can't. <clears throat> it's like we're trying to build ourselves up. We're not trying to act oppressed. You know, I'm not. I, I, I definitely do not feel oppressed in a nation where I can literally say whatever the hell I want and yeah. you know go down and protest and you know not fear of being you know sent to jail because i went to the wrong neighborhood or i went to the wrong you know side of the restaurant or whatnot and yeah. it's like i can literally buy my own property i can you know buy my own house i can even buy my own damn land if i want to yeah. so it's like how in the world am i oppressed like you have to keep that in mind <laughs> Is is that yes, there is racism out there, of course, and there yeah. are people with very racial biases. Here's the thing: racism is never going to go away. Just like murder <laughs> isn't not going to go away. Just like sexual no. assault is not going to go away. It's like it's always going to be there. Every human being has their vice, but exactly. but at the same time, though, the black community cannot keep living in the past. They can't keep living in a victim mentality. We have to take our responsibility for ourselves. The black community has to do that. We can't depend on these empty Twitter slogans that are going to be outdated in five years, Black Lives Matter and all that. It's like, okay, where were, where were these people when you know numerous amounts of black people were killed by other rioters during this whole situation? Like that Daryl, Dave, oh, sorry, what's it called? David Dorn, Daryl Dorn? Yeah, David Dorn. Yeah, yeah he got killed looks- by his own people for a damn television yeah. set, and he didn't serve his community for se- uh, for 40 years. 77 years yeah. old, got shot like a dog because he yeah. wanted to help his friends pawn shop out. Where are all these white liberals talking about him then? They, yeah. I have not seen him ter- start trending. Well, well, talking about that, right? Talking about yeah. that murder, right? I saw another a black police officer being racially called on uh, by white people, right? These protesters, because and where and I look at that, and you're talking about the murder. Then I'm looking at another police officer who's being all the racial slurs you can be saying to a black man being called by white people, and that's okay because it's from their group or their political side. And I find it so offensive that nobody talks about all these other. I mean, the last I heard was a, a ten people had been murdered in the name of one person who was a. You know, it, was, it, was, it, was actually, it actually raised up to one. Hmm. 21 people. Like, got yeah, 10 to 1. And there's probably going to be more. Um, I mean, there was, a, there was one where the little child, a, a 10-year-old nearly burned to death, a female, a little girl nearly burned to death in her own house because some person had set the house on fire. Well, Black Lives Matter, right? Yeah. I, I think it's, it's kind of weird that people think that it's okay to – behave like a criminal because it's political to do so and let's talk you know you talked about uh, personal um you know taking responsibility and agency over yourselves and i think you know over your own life i think that's something that we keep not um that keeps gets pushed aside uh when people talk about things and they try to politicize so um tell me a bit more about yourself i mean we just decided talking a little bit about being out of chicago and stuff tell us about a bit about yourself uh well not getting into too many details um i basically went to chicago well i was actually uh i I, my hometown is chicago actually Uh, i moved out to the suburbs at a very young age and uh when i turned 18 i went back to school um for um studying game development uh in chicago and during my time over there um, in Chicago, I, I I fundamentally saw that you know this whole city went into a complete decay when I was gone for that much time, mm-hmm. and it's like while well, I'm going downtown and I'm seeing you know this this ritzy place with all of these you know these nice stores, these nice high rises, and when I go back into the inner cities. It's all nothing but the burnt out buildings, um, buildings that are not boarded, buildings that are boarded up, empty abandoned buildings, you know, abandoned factories, abandoned apartment buildings. And I'm like, like, 
it's like we talk about black excellence all the time, but what the hell is the black community doing to raise itself up? Because we can't depend on other groups of people to do it for us. And it's like what you what you see on the television when it comes to the crime rate is 100% correct. It's like the inner cities of Chicago are very, very dangerous, like very dangerous right now. And more than ever now, it's like people are finally um, having enough and you've got a lot, whole lot of people moving out of the city. Just um, moving down south because it's like it's much cheaper and actually much safer to move to a smaller town. Mm. And personally, I've had an I, I personally had it when I saw you know a black guy getting killed by the uh, cops, but because he was stabbing people in the street. And that's was one of the main reasons why I just moved out. And I saw that I actually saw that. And seeing somebody's life getting taken away like that mm. in an area that I uh, I was actually in, I lived in South Chicago, mm. and that was enough for me to say, you know what, enough is enough. And I took, I I, I just took myself and left. I took my immediate family and I just left. Mm. So now we're um, I'm living in a much more peaceful area, and um, yeah, I don't have to worry about. Um, watching my back now. Yeah, and that's that's, that's something that really um, it, it's uh, it not many people talk about when it comes to Black Lives Matter or about race and stuff. It's where you know where, where your own life is at, at um, you know at risk at the, by other black at, people. Yeah, in your own neighborhood, in your own area. Now, one thing that really um that. I kind of thought about with all this destruction, all this looting and stuff and all the destruction of the business was that about what's going to happen when, excuse me, when, when all this is said and done and all the, uh, all the, all these areas are destroyed, uh, the well. only people that will be able to build, come back into these other medium to upper class, rich white people because the black people won't be able to build again and the neighborhoods won't be the same again i the, i i have a suspicion that this was yeah. probably an orchestrated move to basically get all the lower class people out of the city so they can get all the white folks in try to gentrify yeah. the area even more now yeah and, and ultimately it's time is it really is time for you know to get out of these major cities because they have they're far beyond control now. Yeah. They've gotten too big and they've gotten too bloated for <clears throat> you no know, everyday life. And I found that life is much better when you live in a smaller area and you have more accountability. And the thing is, though, you don't have this much police brutality in these smaller towns. No. You don't. Well, the other thing is that police uh, don't have to worry um, because they do community work, right? In these uh, smaller areas, they're more concerned about making sure the community is happy. There's less crime rate and so on. But when you're like um, when you're in the city, you, when you see people running around with guns, or you know that there's going to be a you know a banger on the corner selling drugs, you become more militant in your policing uh, yeah. because you become more uh, um, hyper hyper vigilant and you think about well does he have a weapon on him is he going to hurt me as a police officer if i yeah. arrest him you know that sort of thing but yeah gentrification is something that really came to mind last week when i was thinking about all this because once you know the whole you know getting rid of all the lower income um black folk or Hisp hispanics asians or what have you in those areas, the only people that will be able to build their homes again are the richer people who are predominantly well, white. I, that, that's a crazy thing. It's like even the rich people are leaving mm. because it's like, well, all the poor people not subsidizing the taxes. It's like it's gonna be, it's gonna, the taxes are going to go up, yeah. and who's gonna be paying for, uh, who's gonna be footing the bill are the rich people. So even the rich people are now leaving like places like New York. They. they so it's gonna it's gonna backfire immensely on these cities. It's like even Chicago, even the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, she's basically begging Walmart not to leave. Yeah. 
and that's a major player. So yeah. when you don't have Walmart anymore, that knows that you gotta start, you gotta get your you gotta get your act together. Right. We had Burger King leave, leave New Zealand. Oh wow, why? Yeah. And uh, and the thing is people don't realize that like as you mentioned with Walmart, it's the employment. The people being employed. And uh, you know, the rage I think came out um, so much more was because so many people were in lockdown and ha being harassed to be in lockdown by the police going into it during the lockdown period. You know, in, in the US with 30 million people um, losing their jobs, we had, I think 10%, 1% uh, of that, we had like about 30,000 people here, but we only have like a four and a half million people in our country, but we had 30,000 people lose their jobs here in that time. Well, yeah, we have four. I think we have forty million people losing their jobs wow. in America. Forty-four million, to be exact. Yeah, Do that's you, forty million people who can't support themselves and their families. Right, and with the lockdowns, it's like that. That that compounded everything, really. So you have people who are in isolation for like months, almost like six months, and still going. By the way, yeah, uh, you know they can't. They couldn't visit their loved ones because their fear of the spreading of the thing. Yeah. Um, and then you got people who lost their loved ones because of the pandemic. They couldn't yeah. even go, uh, they couldn't even go visit them in the hospital or even bury them. Yeah. So you got all that going on. So it's like, you have a lot of rage and hmm. anger going on. But and also compounded by the by the laws of that city, right? Like uh, you, um, I think there was some mayor, a governor somewhere, who was like basically saying, "We're going to lock you up if you're getting out of your house," uh, you know, if you don't obey the curfew or so much. That, um, that's, that's know, a, yeah, that's most of the governors and the mayors, and it's like yeah. people have had it. It's like they say, "F no, we won't go." Yeah. And then that rage fall, falls into, you know, this situation here with the death of Floyd. And everybody's just angry because the police have been like, you know, saying, stay in your home or we will arrest you. And I, I knew this, this, you know, this would happen when people get um, angry being locked up. And, um, you know, because you can't isolate people for so long. I mean, you look at prisons, right? People become like animals when they go to prison. And um, because, you know, they just... Have, um, the people don't realize. Let's talk, let's talk about freedom, right? I mean, like people talk about freedom and freedom and freedom, but they don't really understand how free we are in the West compared to how free people aren't in the East and in um, communist countries and so on. Exactly. I mean, it's like is that sentiment mostly comes from very middle class people. It, it comes from very middle class people who don't have to worry about you know the dangers of the world. Mm. Well, they've never, never gotten out of their own little shell or their bubble. And this is, I think this is one of the problems that's being in a bubble, you know, like politically, uh, uh, community wise, or, you know, even in your fans, if you're in a bubble and you don't experience anything else outside of that, you just have this one, one view of the, how the world works. And, um, you know, they don't, people who live in that bubble basically only spout that bubbles, um, narrative, or they, you know, they have that group think that I think find, um, I find very destructive when people just stay with them, um, you know, within speaking the same language, using the same uh, hashtags or, you know, um, and so on. And, you know, if you're not with us, you're against this kind of mentality. Um, it's very dangerous. And I think we, this is what we're seeing is because of that mentality, we're seeing so much destruction happening. These riots were never about George Floyd. Yeah, they they've stopped becoming about George Floyd about a week ago. This is mostly just uh, trying to transform, radically transform culture because, and this has been campaigned. This has been campaigned. This has been compounded. I'm sorry, by mm -hmm. you know the lockdowns. It's like people have had enough. Had this not happened, it's like people would have just went back to normal. Yeah, but this is just a fundament. This is just a riot against fundamental. Uh, just the fundamental aspects of society now. Yeah. All right, we're coming up to the um, hour and quarter mark. Any last words uh, oh. about gaming and so on before you know I'll let you go? Um, thank you again for you know taking the opportunity to just you know 
appreciating you coming on board, man. I, uh, you know, it's um, having this discussion. It's um, it's not normal um, uh, for me to just go, hey, uh, you know, because I've never thought that somebody from, <laughs> you know, like yourself would just jump on and hey, come along and have a discussion about what's going on in your side of the world. I mean, well, I it's, think- it's it's good to get different perspectives from various different places from the world. So I'm glad I can uh, add my voice to things. Awesome. Uh, so any last words? Yeah. Um, if you, I will always say this, be the change you want to be. You know, don't let somebody else try to give you a handout or, uh, you know, try to give you special treatment. Just always, it's like with game development. I feel that we rely too much on established legacy IPs and not enough on try to trailblaze the new generation. And that's what you're going to be seeing from years to come. It's like you're going to have to many gamers i would say there are a lot of people who are now inspired to create their own form of escapism due to these events so there's always a silver lining to every dark cloud and there's an immeasurable value in escapism there's an immeasurable value when it comes to you know people trying to escape from the real world it's not you know, it's not silence or it's not silence or violence that you don't want to speak on stuff or you just want to run away. It's knowing that you can retreat to a much better time in your life to recharge yourself so you can come back and then deal with your real world problems. And that's what these, um, that's what a lot of these established legacy franchises, that's what they used to do. And so what I feel is that we need to bring that back there's a renaissance going on and people just don't know about it. Well, a lot of people know about it now. And hopefully this will be the catalyst that will fundamentally change how things are made. So I'm glad that all this open source software is open. So people can go out and create their own dreams. And when it comes to civil unrest when it comes to let's say the culture war stuff it doesn't really last that long you know and what we're seeing right now is pretty much the death throes of an a, a very cancerous ideology and what <clears throat> what i can offer you is this not one person not one party not one ideology is going to give you the utopia but you of what you want and you got to build your own utopia you know you got to build the best life for you and it's like last thing i'll say this if you worry too much about other people across the world you're never going to be happy and i know that's a selfish thing to say but it's the truth. It's like you can't keep worrying about people who you've never met or you've never really interacted with. So the best thing you can do is focus on yourself and your well-being and the well-being of your inner circle. And what I hope to do is to provide some relief into your life. So I may... I, it may be a long time before you see the fruits of my labor, folks, but rest assured that I will do my damnedest to entertain you, and I will do my damnedest to make sure that you have at least one positive thing to look forward to when you go home. So that's all I have to say. And uh, thank you for having me on, Malfunction. Yeah. Cheers, brother. Thank you for being on. I uh, appreciate it. And um uh... We'll see you on Twitter and we'll hook up on Facebook as well. Um, Kakite Ano, guys, thank you for joining us uh, from here in New Zealand. Whangarei, it's been it's still a lovely day. It's very early. It's only 20 minutes past 11 a.m. on a Monday. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's, it's going to be a nice and sunny day. And thank you, Black Sage, uh, for coming on, man. I really appreciate it once again. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah. thank, thank you, guys, and we'll see you next time.
Okay. All right. Did you want to say goodbye as well, or you're good? Um, all I have to say is, uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's where I'm mostly at. It is, um, let's see, it's at capital B, black D, capital D, G, gamer one. So that's um, at B, D. Here's, here's, here, here it is in the chat. Um, all right. Yep. There you go. All right. Let me just grab it off there. So Excellent. if anybody wants to follow me there and get all my quote unquote hot takes, it is um at Black D Gamer One. There you go, guys. And if Thank you, you want to, um sorry, um if you want to see my YouTube channel, um it is um Black D Gamer. So here it is. Uh follow me on YouTube. That's my second second means right there. Um it's just called Black D Gamer. All right. There we go. It's in chat, guys. Thank you so much, man. I'll, we'll catch you later. And uh, for you guys watching um, on Facebook, thank you for joining us. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, like, subscribe, as they say, and uh, share if you want. And I um, appreciate it. So, cut it down once again. Hey, thanks, Black, um, Black Day. Um, awesome, man. Black Sage. No thank problem. you so much.